crazy lady that started all this. Um, <laughs> Save the prison. Um, so I appreciate you coming out. Um, obviously, you've been watching the newspapers and uh, you've seen what, um, as far as the efforts, <clears throat> what I can, I'll recap, um, sort of, I started this day two, as soon as the, they put the fire out. <laughs> Um, I knew that that building was going to be in jeopardy uh, just because of talks from commissioners for a period of time in the past couple of years of uh, making comments about tearing that down and selling the stone, okay? So I knew as soon as that fire was out that we needed to get our get the community's voices heard because that could potentially happen. And we saw two days later on the front page of the Daily Item, we saw none other than Mr. Clausey with his own equipment outside was that a staged behavior was that just attention seeking i don't know but thank goodness for code office because they stopped him and the fire marshal and said you know get off the land or we'll have you arrested so um so i'm really not sure what that stunt was was he really going to knock the turret down i don't know but i i don't of course um trust that as far as i will throw it could throw it um so so then i started Moving even, uh, I've been calling, um, just so you know, I've been calling the commissioner's office since January. They will not return my phone calls, nor will they meet with me. I then involved Linda Schlegel um, about two weeks ago. Linda called and spoke with Mr. Clausey himself, and he said, well, we really can't say much because we're still dealing with the insurance company. Well, now, I would like to think the community is pretty intelligent by the fact that when you have a several oh, a 30 million dollar policy and we know out that came out in the newspapers that 2.5 million was what the insurance company came up with so that pretty much tells me that if that's all the damage that the fire company insurance company thinks that happened within those walls um there's not you know yes there's damage but i think it's stuff that could be managed is it going to take money yes it is i know that everyone keeps saying to me where are you getting the money for that i don't know I'm not Mrs. Rockefeller, but that's why we need to continue with these meetings, and that's why I asked Aaron to come in from PA Preservation, Preservation PA, either way, either way, that's, um, <clears throat> to come up with, yeah, as long as I get Preservation and PA in there, we're all right, um, to come up tonight and talk to us about what steps could we take, you know, because there's a lot of legal, there's a lot of legalities in it. Um, uh, so back to Mr. Clausey. So Linda got him to commit to meet with me. So I called him, called a secretary. We set up a date. I called to confirm. And then I got, um, well, Mr. Clausey said Linda said to cancel the meeting because we don't know what's going on with the insurance company. So then I called and talked with Linda. I called Linda's office. Linda called me back two days later and spoke with me and said, Vicki, I would never tell him to not meet with you. And I knew that that was the case. So Mr. Clausey has already lied to me. Two things you do to me is lie to me or steal from me and you're done. He was done in my book a long time ago. And believe me, this tonight's not about bashing Mr. Clausey, but I just want you to understand that I'm trying to take the steps that need to be taken to get some answers. Because I have been, um, I have gotten private messages from people telling me I'm not doing enough. Um, I can only do so much. I can't, you know, go in there, you know, I can't make the man sit down with me. Um, so that's where I'm at. I did go to one of the um, prison board meeting and I did address the prison board and that's when Mr. Brighty goes, oh yes, that's right, I wanted to do a media day. And so they did media day. And media, did, media day did exactly what Mr. Brighty wanted them to do. They turned, if you watched it on Newswatch 16, did you hear the tone of that media day? It was as if this group didn't have a clue because what they were saying, they were turning it around and putting it back on us. So it was Mr. Mr. Brighty saying, look at the pulverized rock. And the Newswatch 16 cameraman went to this rock and guess what? It wasn't pulverized, just saying. So then, he, then you have the other gentleman outside talking about how does this group want these prisoners to come back to this prison? I don't believe at any point in time that I said I want prisoners to be turned back there. I have said I don't want to see the facade otter or that wall to be torn down. Okay, so no time did I say I want prisoners put back in there. So that's what media day got us. Now, I had little scouts on the inside who took pictures for me and then sent them to me. So if there's something I'm good at, it's schmoozing. So I have kept media on my good side, <laughs> except for none of them are showing up tonight, which was, I followed up with them all today. Um, and unfortunately, the daily item, they can't make it tonight. 
WBRE, they're going to, she is going to, Valerie Rose is going to try to do a feature story as opposed to just coming to this, which is much better than just coming to this meeting. So I said, I'll take it. Nikki Cries from Newswatch 16 said the same thing. So because they have covered it so extensively, you know, sometimes they have bosses that have to approve. So I said to Valerie, work on that. We'll gladly take this feature story. You know? So I need the media to work with me. Daily Item has been great up until tonight. They were busy. They couldn't get here. Nothing that can't be fixed. I will write an article and submit it by tomorrow. So we will get press. And a lot of times my articles are better written than theirs. Just, just saying. <laughs> uh, they, do, they do like to take things out sometimes, though. But, but um, anyway, I, I'm pretty good. I think I should be on the staff there. But that's how I know what happens is, is truthful, because I wrote it. But so <clears throat> that pretty much brings us up to speed. Now, you're seeing us wearing these t-shirts. And so not that we want to exclude the community. Well, we had a meeting, the committee, we have a core committee that has, that has been uh, working on this. And so um, we sort of really went, do we want to offer t-shirts to the community or not? Is it too early to do that? Um, and so that's why the committee has them on tonight. And again, this was if the media came, we wanted to <laughs> be up in their face and say, here we are, okay? But um, after, uh, Tracy here is the one that took care of all of this, and thank you, Tracy. Um, so I think we will, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think if we have more people wearing them, can't help to see us come. Wear them to Riverfest, wear them to Pine Otters, wear them to National Night Out, wear them wherever you go. Um, so I think maybe what we'll do is go ahead and open it up to the community, and what we'll do is sell them um, for $20 a piece, and um, you folks that are here tonight can get them for the regular cost, but when we do the, uh, because you're here, thank you. But when we open it up to the community, we want to, it's, it's okay to start a fundraiser now. I think it's okay. And we'll, we, can, we can look at the legal part of that as far as all the What's that? We can have representatives with the shirts and shirts or take orders at Riverfest. I'm just saying wear them there. If we can get them prior to that, wear them there. You know, I don't know that. I, I can't be there to have a stand or anything like that. Um, yeah, we do have a website that's up and running. So it's www. Oh, it's on the back of my shirt. This, yeah, there you go. If I put it on my butt, it'll really stick out. So <laughs> you'll be able to read it really well then. Yes, ma'am. A lot of older people are more interested in saving the prison. And I think instead of the internet or the, the computer, you should have them out there for us to pick up at places like the river fest. Okay. So we don't have to deal with the computer because there are a lot of people so what do you think about possibly holding, um, I don't, so uh, not not to be rude or anything, but uh, high rises. I mean, I know that happens to be, like they can't get out to meetings, and, you know, Anywhere, things like that. Everywhere, everywhere. Okay. We'd have to ask that because it's a whole political thing. Okay. Yeah. We can try, but well, you know, well, and I think what the sounds great. Yeah. It's going to be hard to know how many shirts it takes for everybody <clears> to not, you know, totally run out of them. Right. Right, so we can get it up on the website. We'll put it out on Facebook, things like that. We can definitely, uh, when I write it, I can put a blurb in the the North newspaper article that we're taking orders for T-shirts. We'll 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 get it out there. Yeah, and, I would uh, be willing to bet if you took them to Riverfest, you'd sell them. I just, I yeah, I talk to older people, and we're just we're the ones that are interested in these prints and posters. All right. Um, and I think the other thing, we do have an online petition, which I wasn't able to check today. We were like, I did not get a chance we were like, as of what, yesterday, I think we were 13, 13 less signatures than 200. Yeah. So, so probably what we should do also is have a paper petition and then do that and have people taking that to work, you know, wherever. And, and the more, more signatures that we can slap in front of them, the better. So, okay, well, I'm going to digress because I really want to have Aaron have the floor and your questions and, and she's knowledgeable one here on where do we go from here what do we do and, and all of that but um, before we leave um, new faces if I could get your contact information um, and that way I can contact you and so we can maybe talk a little more about where I should be with all of that okay and um, so if we could send a piece of paper back Karen you ready um, okay uh, 
since I clearly have no clue where Erin's from, I'll let her tell you. I'll just introduce myself, sure. <laughs> and I see that you have things set up for a presentation. I didn't prepare a formal presentation. I think it's so probably just set up. We'll just talk tonight, and then if you want me to come back and, you know, show pictures and make things more official, we can do that. So I'm Erin Hammerstedt. I work for Preservation Pennsylvania, which is a statewide historic preservation nonprofit. Um, we're based in Harrisburg. Our office is in Harrisburg. I actually live in State College. But a month from now, I'll be living in Pillow, just down the road. Oh, so, oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, if I can work out all the deals. I'm, I'm at that point in buying real estate where everything's going wrong, but hopefully I'll be closing in two weeks and moving to Pillow. In other words, you're at the point where, why did I start doing this? No, I really want this. It's going to happen. I just now have, this is like the test of like, how much do you want it? How hard are you willing to work? You know? So afterwards, if anyone wants to talk to me about licensed electricians or plumbers or contractors, come see me. <laughs> Um, you got them to show up as a trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I figure that this, we're totally getting off track, but generally when it, we're working with old buildings, you have to call four to get one right. to come. That's my experience. Can I give you my business card? <laughs> sure, afterwards, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, all right. Let's, we'll, let's, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But first, let's talk about you before we talk about me. Um, oh, I'll finish my introduction, though. So, Preservation Pennsylvania is, a, again, statewide membership um, organization. Um, and we have lots of programs that are sort of, every year we do the same thing. We have a conference every year. We have an endangered properties program, which certainly you should consider list, nominating this to our endangered properties program next year. Um, we also have an awards program where we recognize good projects or people who are sort of moving and shaking in preservation. So um, we do, yeah, some, some of us shake more than others. Yeah, I shake. Um, so, so that's what we do, but what I do is I am available at no cost to go around the entire state of Pennsylvania and help people with preservation projects or challenges. Um, and so Victoria found me, I'm not sure how, probably online or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, and asked me to come out and talk with you. So I'm here tonight just to, um, I can lay out some sort of basics of you know, steps we might wanna do from here. But really, I want to answer your questions um, and talk about some of the, your, your ideas and concerns. Um, so I guess for starters, I FIRE, I'll just tell you again a little bit about me. FIRE is like my nemesis. I, for the last 10 years, lived in Belfont. And I don't know if you ever hear about Belfont. Belfont loses so many of its historic buildings to FIRE. And so I've been working on specific task forces and producing publications on how to prevent fires and minimize their damage in historic buildings. So it's really an issue that um, means a lot to me. And so this, the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission, which is the state agency on historic preservation, knows that. And so they always send me information. I don't know why. I think they try to depress me. I think they don't like my enthusiasm, so they try to bring me down. But they always send me articles when we have historic buildings around the state with fires, knowing that those are people that might need, might need my help. So anyway, I heard about this fire shortly after it happened, and I was really ready for the phone to ring. You know, oh, we're busy enough that we aren't usually proactive in going out and, and seeking out um, projects. But so I was really glad when I when I heard from Victoria about this. I was glad to hear that there's something going on. Um, I'm not really sure where we want to start in talking about what to do. Um, do you want me to just start by talking about? some ideas or do you want to talk with me as I understand the situation the building is closed everybody's been moved out it's owned by an authority of the county like a subgroup of the county they don't want it anymore they don't want to use it anymore um, they don't know what they're going to do with it and that's where we stand that they've sort of temporarily stabilized the building um, is that sort of the, the, the situation in a nutshell okay I mean, it's not really considered quote a, a historical building, but it's what? in the historic area. It, it so, is a historic okay. building. I mean, are we are we you know, are we pursuing the right avenue by looking to this entity to help support our cause to guide us in this cause? Absolutely. So, a little bit about historic designation. I didn't check this. I'm just going with what you told me on this, and I can always double check it. So, the way historic designation works. There are different levels of designation. So they can be designated locally, it can be designated at the state level, 
which is what we call eligible for the National Register. In Pennsylvania, we use the same criteria. Or it can be listed in the National Register of Historic Places. And the prison is not individually listed in the National Register, but it is a contributing building in the Sunbury Historic District. So for all intents and purposes, it is, is the district listed or is it eligible? Yes. Listed. Listed. And it's a significant part. Okay. So, so it is actually listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which is the high thing. The National Historic Landmark designation is theoretically higher, but it doesn't get you anything that National Register listing doesn't do. So you are, the prison is a historic resource the way we define it. It is listed in the National Register of Historic Places which means that where um, the National Register doesn't do anything to protect historic property um, at the private level. It doesn't, there's no regulation that comes with that. You know, you hear about, I don't know, I think Lewisburg might be the closest example of a local historic commission where if you want to change the color of your house or you want to replace your porch or something, you have to go through a local review. That does not happen at the National Register level. That's a local ordinance. So being listed on the National Register doesn't mean the county can't tear it down. It doesn't mean they can't put a parking lot there. It doesn't mean they can't build a new building there. Um, so, but the National Register designation, the historic designation, does mean that if they're using federal or state money, or if they need federal or state permits, there is a review process um, that they have to go through. It doesn't mean that they can't do it, but it gives them a whole lot of hoops to jump through. Um, and if it's federal money, they have to consult with interested members of the public at the state level. If they don't really have to, but we try to get them to do it anyway. Um, it sounds like at this point, we don't know if we have that hook. We don't know what kind of money they're using. But for example, CDBG money, Community Development Block Grant money, which you probably get, which often communities use for demolition, that's federal money. And so that would, that's going to come with a review that, the, that they're going to have to go through. So Can we get a listing that would prevent the municipal authority, I think is the one that holds it down, to prevent them from tearing it down? Because it is on the National Registry. Of in Pennsylvania, it was the last public hanging, hanging in 18, 1878 of the Molly McGuire's, uh, that whole cold issue of whatever in the mm -hmm. But it is, it is listed um, as Pennsylvania's last public hanging that occurred in the Montgomery County Prison. Yeah. So it, it, can we use the history of it, early history of it, to um, get a designation which would give us the availability of block grants and so forth and see if the municipal authority would turn it over to us for a dollar or whatever value, okay, uh, for historical renovation. Mm -hmm. And then if we can get historical funds to renovate it, mm -hmm. we can provide tours and actual experiences for people in those prison cells when they go through. So you've got 15 minutes in the prison cell, we lock the entrance. What, you, what it's like. Most yeah. people freak out. Um, well, I, in that prison, yeah, most people would freak out. So I think to that, in, that the way things work in the preservation system, that's kind of two separate questions. So one is, can we do something to prevent demolition? Um, I can think of two ways. One is that the city could pass a demolition ordinance if they don't have one that spells out what terms, you know, what conditions have to be met if someone wants to demolish property. It can't just target that property. It has to be, a, you know, municipal wide. But there can be a historic district overlay, for example, where they can say everything, every proposed demolition in the historic district requires review by the planning commission or zoning hearing board or whoever. So demolition ordinance is one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to adopt a historic preservation ordinance, whether you do a standalone preservation ordinance or you do a zoning overlay. Those both have to happen at the city level. They both have to have you know public hearings and things like that. They're going to take a few months, um, but they're great tools. And you can craft them to be whatever you want them to be. Again, if you have a historic preservation ordinance, it doesn't have to regulate paint color. It doesn't have to regulate replacement windows. It can just regulate demolition and new construction if you want it. To. There must be something like that. Um, 
uh, with the Chestnut Street projects they did a number of years ago. You, you couldn't use new materials, you had to use originally what was there, the trim and all that. Paint color wasn't included, but you had to use the original style of the building and reproduce it. You couldn't just put siding over it. It could like that. be that that was one of those, again, that they might have been using government money, government. and that government money comes with strings attached. So it wasn't the local regulation doing that, it was the strings attached to the money. So the same thing will happen if they want to use government money to tear that down. Or, or do something else, then those there will be similar strings attached. That they have to meet what's called the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. And um, so it's not super restrictive. I mean, it's not a restoration. You're not taking something back to the way it was at a particular period in time. But it, it has um, you know certain restrictions on what you can and can't do. And demolition usually is something that is not, uh, doesn't meet the standards usually. Um, so, so that was the first part of the question is, is there something we can do for demolition? And basically the answer is anything that can happen to prevent demolition needs to be a city ordinance, basically. Um, the, I mean, there is a potential that when demolition is imminent, an injunction could be filed. I don't know a whole lot about injunctions. I've only used them on a couple of, proper, on a couple of projects successfully. And the catches with that are, um, you know, you have to have a, a stake in it, which I would imagine a community group could demonstrate if you have a stake. But you also have to post a bond. Um, and so usually there's sort of a mad dash fundraising effort to post a bond for an injunction. Usually it's sort of a nominal amount, but it can mean like ten to $50,000. Like it's not $500. It's, it's a significant amount that they basically, I think, want to make sure you have some skin in the game. And if this gets into a legal thing, they know that the funds are there to take so an injunction is, I like to think of it as sort of a last ditch. Like once you feel the bulldozers driving down the road, that's when you run to the courthouse and file that injunction. And you usually have only 24 hours though to post that bond. So you might want to start fundraising. It, it could be sort of a legal defense fund, or if you don't need that, then it could go into the rehabilitation or something like that. Um, a little note on fundraising. Again, there's some legal things that you mentioned really be best to have a nonprofit organization that's a 501c3 sort of willing to be your umbrella, whether that's the historical society or the downtown revitalization group or something like that, um, or any other community group that sort of makes sense, that's in their mission to do this kind of thing, um, that would help make it a little bit more legitimate to fundraise. So, um, the other part of your question was about reuse, potential reuse, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that one very real possibility, and we see this happen in certain situations, if the county, it's sort of maybe a best case, well, maybe the best case is the county's gonna rehab it themselves, but um, a good alternative would be, so we know that the county got $2.5 million to fix that building. Well, the best situation would be that there's an organization that wants that building, and that they give you that property and $2.5 million to get started on fixing the building up. Um, that's a very, a very real, I mean, you're taking that burden off their hands, so it's a justifiable, in, in my opinion, you know, use of government money, and that's what the money was intended for. Um, they're probably earmarking it for demolition. They're, they're probably we're not gonna... getting all of the information yeah. consistently from the county, all right? You, uh, this lady was dealing with, Victoria mm -hmm. was dealing with Clausy. He's on his way out. He could care less what happened. He just wants to cause a little commotion. Right. <laughs> In dealing with the election coming up, Mr. Shock is ready again. So he might maybe he might be the one to approach and say, look, we want to deal with the prison. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Getting information, as, as you might imagine, sometimes the information doesn't flow that easily to me down there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Most organizations, it doesn't flow as easily. Most families, it doesn't even flow. No, it's, 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 not, it's a fact it's of life. To, yeah, it's not exclusive. If you don't have all of the total truth about what's available funds wise, then people can't go to the powers of be and say, look, that prison is yeah. repairable. Yeah. That prison could be usable. However, we have new rules 
about prison buildings that this old prison will not comply with. It's, it's likely, I don't know this for sure, it's likely that that is outdated as a prison and that sort of, I don't know if, if the prison system works the way the sort of general building codes do, but sort of like once the occupancy has been abandoned, yes. it's hard to get it back sometimes. Right I'm back sort of guessing that as long as they were using it, it was probably okay. Yes. But now that they've stopped using it, it's probably going to be really hard to get that to be compliant. It's called grandfather. They don't have it anymore. Usually you have a year, and at this point they're not going to get it fixed up and get people back in in a year. So I'm guessing that that use is pro it's probably valid to say that that's no longer I can't say for sure, but it probably is a valid argument if they say it can't be used as a prison anymore. That's, well, that's but quite likely. We don't get the facts and figures we need. We need to, things like, stupid things like the square footage for each inning, you know, mm -hmm. versus today versus what they had before, of course, it's not satisfactory. Mm -hmm. And because they were still using it, they, they didn't have to update everything. Mm -hmm. And so I've heard about redoing the prison for 20 years since right. I've been in the community. So, what, what goes on is that it can be reused for something. It can also be, be used just basically as a holding area, which is what they were using it for, for before court and stuff. Uh, and you also could develop, if you, if you can get a hold of it without it being very costly, you could develop tours in there. You could, it's, re, it's repairable. Let's it, talk. The building is repairable. Yeah, let's talk about, about money and where, where money could come from and what the problems with that are going to be. Did you have a question first though before you on? I thought I saw a hand. No? Okay. Um, we will, so money. So that's going to be the big thing. So there's $2.5 million in insurance money that was supposed to go to fix that building up. Um, that's out there somewhere. Um, and I don't know if that can be designated for something else or not. I'm not sure. Um, a lot of people want grants. They say, oh, well, it's a historic building, we'll get a grant. Well, Pennsylvania currently has one grant for historic preservation, um, exclusively for historic preservation. And that can be up to $25,000 for planning and up to $50,000 for construction. So, and it can only be used by municipalities or units of government and nonprofits. So it's not available to private property owners, and it's not very much money. No. Um, so the reality is grants aren't going to do it. Um, grants can help. Grants can help close a gap. If we have, you know, if we have a plan that's close but not quite there, grants can sort of, sort of help with that. But the idea that there's grant money. Now that being said, that's preservation money. There are <coughs> other grant programs that can be used. Um, community development block grant money. If you have an allocation in your application sort of talks about what you want to use it for and that's an appropriate area and that kind of thing. If the right term, that can be used for community development. Your, I don't know what your Main Street, Elm Street, Keystone Community, whatever your downtown revitalization program is these days. I don't know what your boundary of that is, but there are several programs from the Department of Community and Economic Development that can sort of be channeled towards building reuse. One of them is the Anchor Building Program, which I, I believe you already have Anchor no? You don't have that now. Um, so that is a, a grant to the city that then becomes a revolving loan fund in the city. So it can be up to $500,000 or a third of the project cost for the initial project. There are certain criteria, you know, again, certain criteria that have to be met. The city has to be the applicant. So the city basically gets that $500,000 as a grant and then loans it to the project to be paid on whatever terms, whatever interest rate, whatever duration they want. But then as they get that money back, they get to keep it and use it for other projects. So it's a really valuable tool. Um, there are some other programs like that through the Department of Community and Economic Development. But we would need to know more about sort of your downtown revitalization and, and what your geography and programs is like already. Um, it's really about all I can think of. There are other groups that have small grants um, that might sort of help get things started. Preservation Pennsylvania has a new intervention fund that is like very small. I don't know, we'll, we all have a new budget. We only have less than $1,000 left this year. We have a new budget starting next year and I don't know how much we'll have. But that might be useful either to get uh, structural assessment of the building if we need 
to get sort of a third party um, look at the building to see if it's rehabable um, or it could be used maybe for a, a convening, community convening. We met in um, Sunbury a few years ago and a guy named Donovan Ripkema came in, he's a big economics guru and he sort of taught us um, several people how to do these feasibility studies using members of the community. We actually did one here in Sunbury. So I would imagine that we could sort of do that kind of workshop on this pro property to see, yeah, something like that. Um, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation has a sort of similar small grant. We're talking like $1,000, $1,500. But if we got a couple of those and we pulled them together, that we might be able to at least get a ball rolling um, with something like that. So grant-wise, that's about it. There's not a lot to be said. There um, are rehabilitation investment tax credits. Um, there's a 20% federal credit and a 25% state credit, but the credit in the state is capped at 500,000. Um, those, though, are only available um, for income-producing properties. So it doesn't work for cities or nonprofits. It has to be a tax-paying entity in order to be um, eligible for that. But that's 45% potentially of what you spend to rehabilitate the building comes back to somebody in a tax credit. So usually you need to have a corporate partner. Um, sometimes those are banks. Sometimes those are, I don't know, good neighbors in your community that just need the tax write-off. They have to have an ownership interest in the property um, for five years after the project is completed. <coughs> Um, so it couldn't be sort of nonprofit or whatever for at least five years after that was done. That's the rehabilitation investment tax credit. Um, so you have grants really available for municipalities and nonprofits or tax credits available to for-profit entities. They don't usually work very well together. Sometimes if you're very clever in how you phase a project, you can make something happen. Like perhaps you have a for-profit entity that will come in and stabilize the building, the property, and do some of the, get the mechanical systems up to date and stuff, take the tax credit, sit on it for five years, use it for something, and then sell it to a nonprofit who can get grants to fi finish out the museum or something like that, you know? But um, generally, you, you kind of have to, it get, sometimes it's not worth the fancy footwork to make those work together. Um, Usually you just sort of pick a direction, whether you're nonprofit or for profit, and you sort of go that <coughs> go that direction and use those tools. Yes. Can a, a nonprofit use the historic preservation tax credit uh, to do repairs, like they can fundraise the money to do repairs and obtain those tax credits and then sell them? No. You can sell the state tax credits. The the federal tax credits have to be syndicated, which is Basically, it means, again, someone else can take some credit, but they have to have an ownership interest. Um, so you can have like a 99% financial partner and a 1% operating partner um, and, and work things out that way. But the, the state credit, you can, you can sell it. Um, but I don't believe a nonprofit, I, don't, I think the rules are generally the same, it's just that they've simplified the process. Um, so you do have to be a taxable entity. Now that doesn't mean that a for-profit owner can't lease it to a nonprofit to operate it, but it has to be income producing. So, you know, you can't be a dollar a year rent. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not gonna fly as far as making the case that we're income producing. So, so what, you're, what you're saying is that if we're, if we're going to move forward on this, we're gonna have to be involved in some incident of ownership. 